When we left off yesterday, I was speaking of the microscopic anatomy of the kidney and knowing this definition here, that the nephron is the basic functional unit of the kidney. When I talked about cortex, medulla, pelvis, that's kind of like the structure the, of the primary structures of the kidney. At the microscopic level, level, this is what's doing the work, making the urine in the kidney. Um, and again, I wanna say there's maybe two to 300,000 in a cat, 500,000 of these in a dog. So that kidney is full of individual of these nephrons. Um, and so when they all make urine, it collects through those calluses um, into the pelvis, into the ureter, and then goes to the bladder. And I will say, the kidney is constantly making urine. Um, how fast it makes urine, urine, I mean like, if you guzzle a gallon of water, you're gonna make more urine. If, you, if it's a hot day, you don't have a lot to drink, you don't make as much urine. So there's times when these are gonna be working more or less, but there is always little amounts because the blood is continuously moving throughout the body. Blood is constantly being sent to the kidney. It doesn't stop. So I would say urine production is continuous. How fast it fills and how, how often urination occurs depends on other factors. So these are the main structures, but let me talk about the first thing. Now, we're gonna look at this thing up close. The thing I said looks like a weird kind of seed pod, but this whole thing right here is the Bowman's capsule, okay? So if we go here, this, the renal corpuscle is the entire structure. And it, it, the entire structure is made of a Bowman's capsule. So there's a capsule. There is a space. This yellow space um, is where filtrate is going to be found. And then this is considered a tuft of capillaries. Think about it like a bunch of strings kind of tied together. Now, when blood comes into the kidney, it is afferent. Okay, so this afferent arteriole was a branch of the renal artery. So the renal artery branches, when it comes in, when the blood comes in, it's going to go through this filter. Basically, stuff is gonna get pushed out. Remember when I talked about things that are soluble? Anything that is soluble, or what I say dissolvable, um, can get pushed out through those capillaries. Remember, capillaries are one cell thick, and capillaries have things called fenestrations. Fenestrations are tiny little holes. So let's, let's think of it this way. There's only certain things that can fit through those holes. Okay, the red blood cells should be too big to fit through those holes, the white blood cells, the platelets. So the blood, the components of the blood should remain. But what's gonna happen is a little bit of plasma, which is the fluid in the blood, is gonna get pushed out. Inside that plasma is dissolved components that are soluble. Sodium, potassium, glucose, chloride, um, things like that. Urea, carbon dioxide, there's also some water. Um, this is the first stage of urine production right here. And when the blood gets filtered, the afferent arterial comes in here and pushes out some stuff. What is in this capsule you need to know is called glomerular filtrate. It tells you right at the bottom of the slide, right in here now is filtrate. It is not called urine yet. It is called glomerular filtrate. Let me give you an example. Um, do you guys, if you have a kitchen strainer, okay, you have a strainer, and say I want to empty a can of tomatoes. I've got a can of tomatoes. Um, now, if I dump the tomatoes in the strainer, are the tomatoes gonna come through the strainer? Am I gonna get a bunch of tomatoes that come through? Well, you should be saying no to yourself if you're, oh, there we go. Okay. So that's like what's in the blood. So red blood cells, white blood cells, protein, that's important. Protein in the plasma is a large molecule. It should be too big to fit through the fenestrations. 
So we don't want protein going out of the blood. So what's gonna happen is whatever doesn't go through the strainer, which is right here, is going to leave via the efferent arterial, oxygenated blood, okay? So then that efferent arterial is gonna turn into the peritubular capillaries. But let me go back to the yellow space. In this yellow space, that's what came out of your strainer. If you strain a can of tomatoes, what's gonna come out underneath in your bowl is tomato juice. Okay, and sometimes when you look at the tomato juice, or if you've ever strained something, I don't know if you guys cook at all or watch anybody cook, but when you dump it out and you look at what comes through a strainer, sometimes there are tiny little bits. So certain things fit through the holes on the strainer, certain things remain in the strainer. So I want you to think of this glomerulus like a strainer, and the blood is what's being filtered. What comes out underneath the strainer is called glomerular filtrate. Glomerular filtrate is going to become urine. Glomerular filtrate. But remember, I'm gonna tell you something. When things get pushed out of the strainer, bad things get pushed out, but good things get pushed out. If it's soluble, it's the kidney not yet has determined what it's gonna keep and what it's gonna get rid of. Everything kind of gets just pushed out and then the kidney and the body has to say, what do I want to reclaim? So keep that in your mind as I continue to talk about this. Right now, the glomerular filtrate contains good things and bad things and body water, all of which the body can reclaim. Now the first spot right here that leaves that, um, you get, leaves the corpuscle, there's a yellow tube and it's called the PCT, proximal convoluted tubule. At this level, now the fluid in the tube is not glomerular filtrate. It is called tubular filtrate because it's entered the tubule, okay? At this stage, that, that is going to become urine, but right now it's still called tubular filtrate. All around the PCT, I want you to pay close attention to this picture. Do you see all these red capillaries, okay? At the level of the PCT, the body can reabsorb from the tubule. Say, for example, potassium got filtered out, which it does, okay? And then the body goes, I'm low on potassium. At the PCT, those capillaries can take potassium from the tubular filtrate and suck it back into the bloodstream and it goes back into the body. So when I say reabsorption, reabsorption is materials leaving the tubules and going back into the capillaries, which goes back to the blood. So when I say reabsorption, that's what I mean. Now, potentially in the capillaries, they can still secrete something. Most of the stuff gets pushed out in the glomerulus right here, but materials can leave the tubular area, and they can move into the capillary. That would be secretion. If something's gonna be secreted, it's gonna be put into those yellow tubules, and it's gonna be secreted as urine. So you need to know what I'm talking about when I talk about reabsorption and when I talk about secretion. If anybody right now doesn't understand that, because that will be on the test, I want you to, when I say secretion and I say reabsorption, I wanna know I want you to know what I'm talking about. Reabsorption is when stuff leaves the tubules and goes back into the capillaries to be reabsorbed by the body. And when something is secreted, it's gonna leave the tubules and it's going to, or I'm sorry, it's gonna leave the capillaries, it's gonna go into the tubules. And it's gonna be secreted as urine. So anywhere in these yellow tubes, that is now tubular filtrate. It's not gonna become urine until we get down here to the collecting duct. So right now, while it's in the yellow tubes, we call it tubular filtrate. So the first spot that that happens, if I said on a test, where is the first spot you will find tubular filtrate, you would tell me the proximal convoluted tubule. And if I ask where is the first stage of urine production, you would tell me inside the glomerulus. And if I say, what does the glomerulus produce? 
um, glomerular filtrate, glomerulus, glomerular filtrate, tubular filtrate in the tubules. Okay. The next spot is this loop of Henle. Now the loop of Henle goes down into the medulla and it's going to come back up. It's kind of like the U-turn there. So it descends from the PCT. And why would the ascending wall become thick again? Do you see how it's thin right here? And then it becomes thick as it goes back up from a U-turn? And if you look at your arrows, it shows you the direction. I mean, you don't have to type it. Someone can unmute themselves. Well, think about if it's going up, what does it need to do? If it's being, if it's going up. It's going to be continuing to go up. It's continuing to be filtered. But it also is thicker because it needs to pump that fluid up. See, going down with gravity is easier. It's got a thicker wall as it ascends. But it does have to do a little bit with absorption. Um, when you guys get into pharmacology, um, there is a group of drugs, and they are called loop diuretics. It's a specific type of diuretic because it works at the loop of Henle. And what that does is it forces out water from the bloodstream into the loop of Henle to increase the amount of water that leaves the body. And they are called loop diuretics, and that's why they get their name because they specifically work at this location in the kidney. So if you ever hear that term, a loop diuretic, this is where it's working. This is where it's exerting its effect. Now, the DCT, distal meaning last, is after it comes up, this ascending loop, it's gonna turn into the DCT. All of the DCTs from every nephron are going to eventually empty into a collecting duct. <coughs> and the collecting ducts empty into the renal pelvis. Now, this is important on this slide. On slide 15, you probably want to make a note of this. This is where ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone, and potassium acid base balance are occurring. This is the way I think of it. Things are moving through these tubules, the PCT, the loop of Henle, it's gonna to get to the DCT. This is the last stop before the collecting duct. Do you notice around the collecting duct there are no red capillaries, squigglies? Do you see how there's nothing around that? That means once something enters the collecting duct, the body cannot reclaim it because there is not that capillary network. So the body's last chance to have water balance, um, balance sodium or balance pH in the body, its last chance is here. I'm kind of like, once it enters here, you're SOL, which means shit out of luck. Someone's like, is that a scientific term? I'm like, no. I just say it like that because I'm joking around, but it basically means once anything that is in that tubular filtrate once it makes it to the collecting duct, it's gonna leave the body and the body can't reclaim it. So kind of I think of this DCT is the body's last chance to reclaim potassium or excrete potassium or you know, reclaim body water or increase release of body water. Um, it's that last stop. So that's an important part of the nephron. So I just explained, we're gonna, we're gonna add on this a little bit more, but I just wanted everyone to understand what I was talking about. Um, as every area in the body, I've tried to talk about the nerve supply. It basically comes from the sympathetic portion of the autonomic nervous system. Now the kidneys are going to function even if there was some damage to the nerve supply. Um, but what happens, um, and I've told you in fight and flight, in sympathetic stimulation, um, your heart speeds up, your lungs, the bronchioles dilate, um, basically blood flow to your muscles increase, but what happens is the body is going to take blood from the kidneys, the digestive, remember digestive slows down, 
kidney function slows down during sympathetic stimulation because the body needs those resources. So a sympathetic state is gonna temporarily decrease urine function because what's happening is blood is not being sent to the kidney. I mean, a little bit. They have to maintain some blood supply so that the cells don't die, but there's going to be a large portion of that blood that's gonna be shunted away. So in times of sympathetic stimulation, we know the kidney is not gonna make as much urine. It's why it's important, you know, if you work in ER and you work in, you know, any kind of an emergency situation, when an animal is in a stressful state or in sympathetic stimulation, we work very hard to treat those symptoms to try to get them into parasympathetic state because a persistent sympathetic state it's hard on the heart, um, but I also, you know that it's <coughs> taking resources from these other organs and shifting it. So we have to maintain that balance. Um, now, since we've talked about blood supply so much, um, the renal artery is what supplies the kidney. So it goes aorta, renal artery, and then it's gonna subdivide. So the renal artery is one branch coming into the kidney. Internally, the renal artery is going to start to fan out. And what you're going to start to see are these branches, which are renal arterioles. It's showing you here, once it moves from a renal artery, it's going to go to what's called an afferent arteriole. Afferent is coming in, efferent is leaving, just like when we talked about the nervous system afferent signal, efferent signal. Afferent goes in, it says, hey, can you filter some of this blood? After it pushes out the soluble products, that blood supply leaves that glomerulus and it's gonna become an efferent arterial. The efferent arterial now becomes the peritubular capillaries. That is how the nephron gets its oxygenated blood. The, the kidney gets oxygenated from the peritubular capillaries. We do not oxygenate at an arterial or an arteriole level. We oxygenate at the capillary level. That's when oxygen can diffuse and pick up CO2. When the, the CO2 is picked up, those peritubular capillaries are going to become a renal venule. And then a renal vein, all those renal venules from all the nephrons come to a renal vein and the renal vein is gonna join the vena cava. So hopefully now that we keep talking about blood flow, you're gonna kind of start to see the connection of how it branches to the body in different, every area of the body is gonna have a major artery going to it, mesenteric artery, hepatic artery. Um, and once it gets to that organ, Again, it can't diffuse at that artery level. It's got a branch to tiny little vessels. That's when it can give its oxygen. So afferent glomerular arterioles are the arteries that are coming into the glomerulus. Then they, they are called an efferent glomerular arteriole. And then it becomes a peritubular capillary. And that is where you have oxygen transfer, with CO2, you have also at the capillary level, this is where we can still have secretion and absorption function. Has to happen at the capillary level. One cell thick, fenestrations, I hope everybody's getting this. Um, and what I've just explained here is they come in, afferent comes into the glomerular corpuscle, the glomerular capillaries filter out the plasma, which is what I just explained. So once it goes in here, here's the afferent arteriole, goes through the strainer, gets pushed through the strainer. What's gonna come out in here is some plasma. Plasma contains body water and soluble products. Again, waste products that are soluble, nutrients that are soluble. The one thing that we don't wanna see in there is like the larger components of the plasma. One being protein, and we really shouldn't see those cells because they should be too big to fit through the strainer. 
I hope that analogy makes sense. Analogies is what helped me pass that text poll. Truthfully. Okay. Um, this is where I've already explained. This is where you have oxygen transfer is the peritubular capillaries. You can also, again, reabsorption and secretion. If I ask you, where is the main site of reabsorption in the nephron, you would tell me the peritubular capillaries because the peritubular capillaries is where, um, is where that's gonna happen. Secretion is gonna be either at the PCT, the loop of Henle or the DCT because that's what's secreting the urine out of the body. If there's any questions, throw a hand up. Um, so the nuts and bolts of what the kidney is doing, all of the blood in the body is gonna to go to the kidney, okay? If you think about circulation, a large amount of that blood eventually is gonna make it to the kidney. Blood flow is continuous. This is happening continuously. Whether the animal is sleeping, awake, running, fighting, playing, eating, kidneys are constantly doing their job. It's like a little, think of it like a little plant. It's like a little filter plant. And then when everything gets filtered out, because again, remember I said glomerular filtrate is not specific. It just, I mean, when you dump stuff in a strainer, you can't be like, oh, I shouldn't dump that. You just kind of dump the whole can. And then you're like, what have I got left? I got tomatoes in the strainer. I got juice underneath. What's going to happen as glomerular filtrate becomes tubular filtrate, the body can either reabsorb something that's useful or it's gonna leave it in there or the blood, the capillaries can secrete something that's waste from the blood. So the kidney, it's kind of like, keep it, get rid of it, keep it, get rid of it. Think about they're like kind of like recycling and going through what got pushed out because again, everything gets pushed out. They can't control that. So now the body can decide to reclaim it. Now, I've always told you there is a relationship between the brain, which is monitoring the whole situation and you know, creating what we call homeostasis, which is just keeping everything in balance. And that is what's occurring, is we're trying to keep this all in a balance. Um, now, filtration happens in the renal corpuscles. Um, when blood, now remember, in the blood, in the arterial blood, you have blood pressure because when the ventricle contracts, blood pressure is the relationship between the ventricle contracting and the pressure in the systemic arteries. So uh, there is a certain base blood pressure that is needed for this to occur. Once the blood gets pushed to the cap, to the glomerulus, there's gonna be high blood pressure in that structure. So the pressure in that structure is gonna get a little high to kind of force things out. And it's gonna force the plasma through the fenestrations in the capillary endothelium and the glomerular filtrate is formed. This is important that I would highlight on slide 21. No protein. We do not want protein pushed out. In of that, the, the protein should remain and become and stay in that efferent arterial blood and stay in those capillaries. The protein is supposed to stay in the capillaries. Now, how fast, how much this happens has a relationship to something called GFR. And you need to know what that stands for. That is glomerular filtration rate. The rate of production, how much filtrate is made depends on how much blood is going to the kidney. For example, during sympathetic stimulation, what do you think that does to the GFR of that patient? If there is sympathetic stimulation, how does that affect exactly, exactly? So during sympathetic stimulation, our GFR is decreased. Good. 
it's going to drop because there's not as much blood coming to the kidney. Now, let's, I'm going to flip it for a second. What do you think happens if I have an animal that has organic high blood pressure? Some cats have high blood pressure. So their blood is at an abnormally high pressure. What do you think that's going to do to my GFR? It's going to increase it. Let me put it this way. Say I got those tomatoes. I, you know, most of the time people strain stuff. They just dump it in the strainer, shake it, take your juice, do what you want. What if I push on those tomatoes and I'm pushing in that strainer? What do you think is going to come out through the strainer as I apply pressure to the strainer? What's going to come out under my bowl besides juice? Well, there's going to be a little more juice. Seeds. Good analogy. Tomato bits. I might get some like little chunks of tomatoes. So say I'm protein in the blood, but say I have high blood pressure and then all of a sudden my glomerulus, it's being, the blood is being pushed. Sometimes you're going to get protein that does get pushed out, which is not normal. So what do we do when an animal comes in and we're worried about the kidneys? Well, we do, we do a blood sample, but we also check a urine sample. And when you guys do urine and tests, if you're in a clinic, you've probably done these, but when you're in school, we have these little dipsticks and you take the urine and they have little squares that are different colors and it reacts with the presence of glucose. We check glucose, we check bilirubin, we check white blood cells, we check specific gravity, we check the presence of blood, we check the presence of protein. When we find protein in a urine sample, that's significant because protein is not supposed to be, it's supposed to stay in the vessel, it's not supposed to get pushed out. Now, high blood pressure is one thing that can cause protein, we call it proteinuria. If an animal has protein in the urine, it's proteinuria. So high blood pressure could potentially cause that. Now that animal could be on an extremely high protein diet and they are producing excess protein. That's not as common. Typically when we start to see protein urea, um, protein in the urine can also, if a dog has like a urinary tract infection and they have red blood cells and white blood cells in the urine, they, that will react with the protein reagent and cells in urine will give you a positive protein. So if we have the presence of blood and white blood cells, a lot of times we will show a positive protein on urine. But that's not normal. But what I want you to understand is whatever is in that blood, and when it gets pushed out, if the pressure is higher, first of all, it's gonna increase the amount of filtrate. It's gonna increase production, but it can push out other things that we don't necessarily want. Now, I want you to, if you're, you might be making a connection that says when an animal has a urinary tract infection and there's blood and white blood cells, it's getting pushed out here. Typically when an animal has a urinary tract infection, that the white blood cells are coming from the bladder and the bleeding or the blood is coming from the bladder because it's irritated. So it's not typically happening at this level of the kidney. When, when you're seeing blood in urine, or white blood cells, and trust me, I don't know how many times we see dogs for UTIs. I love doing urines. I got just we just would do them all the time. I got pretty good at at running urinalysis. I mean, a lot of clinics send them to the lab, but our clinic did them all in house, so I got pretty good at looking at it. But when you see the red and white blood cells, it's not because it came out here and then it made it to urine. It's irritation in the bladder that's causing bleeding in the bladder or infection. And then white blood cells go to where the infection is. So that's typically why you find white blood cells in the urine because they're fighting the infection. So hopefully everybody understands that. I didn't want to like, you know, uh, cause, but no, you guys are making the connection there. That's good. So now let's talk about, again, everything gets pushed out of our strainer. So right now, what this is showing you super close up, this is the tubular lumen. A lumen is an opening of a tube. Lumen of a catheter, lumen of a vessel, 
Um, so right here is the wall of the tubular. This could be the PCT, the loop, the DCT. So you see how you have one cells here. We've got this little space. Now here's one of those capillaries. Things that are useful. If I ask you what things does the body want to reclaim? What things does the body find useful? Slide 22 is useful substances that need to be reabsorbed. Sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. These are a lot of our electrolytes. When we do an electrolyte panel on an animal, we're looking at those levels. Those levels help nerve function, cellular function, keeping electrolytes in balance helps cardiac function. So those are very important tests. These are things the body needs for normal function. Now glucose, obviously we need sugar. We got amino acids, chloride bicarbonate, which is a buffer. Remember I talked about acid-base balance. Whenever you see bicarb, bicarb is a buffer in the body to keep the pH in balance so you can have normal cellular function. And then water. So if the body, sometimes it gets pushed out, body water gets pushed out and the body's like, yo, we're a little dehydrated. Can, can I have that water back? So what happens is right now, all these things are in here or most of these things are in here. They are going to go back into the capillary and the body's going to take that capillary blood that goes back into circulation and then sodium, potassium, magnesium, glucose, chloride, but they can be dispersed throughout the body. <clears throat> There's one thing, sodium reabsorption is a little more complicated and I'm, I, you've probably talked about this in chemistry. If you haven't, you're gonna talk about it, but sodium is a larger, um, molecule too, um, but sodium is going to attach to a carrier protein. It's called the sodium co-transport. So what happens is you've got sodium and basically sodium can be pushed out into the interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid is be in between cells and tissues. There's intracellular fluid and interstitial. Interstitial is in between things, not inside the cell. So what happens is sodium's pumped out, moves into the peritubular capillaries. Sodium can also be absorbed in the loop of Henle and the DCT. But what happens is things like to shift back and forth. So when sodium goes back into the blood, it will force hydrogen, ammonium, or sometimes potassium to move the other way. So then if sodium's going back into the capillaries, these are leaving the capillaries and going into the tubular, which hydrogen, ammonium, ammonium, you know, we'll just tell you right there, if you smell urine and sometimes, you know, if your pets have an accident, and then, or sometimes the litter box gets full and you smell it and it's got that ammonia smell because ammonia is one of the key components that is excreted in the urine. Now, the more concentrated that urine is, the stronger the ammonia smell is going to be because there's less water and there's more ammonia. If you have a more diluted urine, there's gonna be more water in it. It's gonna dilute out that ammonia. It's not gonna smell as strong. So the ammonia smell is related to the concentration. And when I say concentration, it's how concentrated is the urine. Let me speak on that for one second. Um, because one thing you guys will check on a urine is we do something called the urine specific gravity. And it's basically testing how much water is in the urine. Now, if you are dehydrated or you haven't drank much in a day, um, the more concentrated your urine is, it means there's less water in it. It's more concentrated with waste products. It'll also look more yellow. I know they used to tell, my son played uh, football his freshman year, and they had a sign in the locker room that was like, if your urine looks like orange Gatorade, you need to tell someone they had a picture of a Gatorade bottle that had the orange color. And they're like, if your urine looks like this, now you're getting to the point where you're definitely 
are not drinking enough water, the body's actually starting to break down muscle, and that's a whole condition in itself. But there are shades of yellow. Orange and brown are not colors that we want to see, but the darker yellow, the more concentrated urine is. When it starts to look like water, then we have it's more watery and it's a less concentrated urine. Like if you drink a gallon of water, when you, you're going to probably go to the bathroom a few times because your body's like, whoa, you took in too much water. It's going to use what it needs and it's going to get rid of the rest and your urine will probably be light yellow to clear. So I will tell you, when an animal urinates in the morning, okay, they've been sleeping all night, you would expect a more concentrated sample. Now, if they've gone, if they've urinated throughout the day, it's gonna sometimes look less yellow because they're emptying their bladder more often, okay, and it's less concentrated. It's why usually, if we want a urine sample from a dog, if we suspect, well, if we suspect kidney issues, urinary tract infection, but I always told owners, can you try and get us the first urine of the day? That's the best representation of their ability to concentrate urine. I mean, we'll take what we can get, but if we have our choice, we either we wanted them in it first thing in the morning so we could get a cysto. And I was like, please don't let your dog bless the bush. I would watch clients, I'm sitting there at the front desk waiting for a client coming in for a urine sample, and I'm watching them walking their dog in the front of the building and letting it pee in the grass or pee on the bush, and I'm like, there's my urine sample. And I'm like, I mean, I always tell clients, I'm like, I know your dog's going to want to get out, sniff, but I'm like, get out of your car and run in the building because I need that urine. Don't let them pee on anything. But that's just to give you an idea of what you can expect at. I want to stop here because I know you guys get to get your next class, and I'm sorry I started late. So I'm going to talk more about this reabsorption and sodium and the moving of that stuff. Um, are there any questions about what we've talked about? This is the most complicated part of this lecture because, again, the structures are simple. Most of it is the physiology. How does the kidney do what it does? Okay, good. Um, I put a reminder also on everybody's page, if you should have gotten an email from Mrs. Thames to review some teachers, it happens every time around week four or five. Um, they just didn't get a lot of them turned back in, so they're just wanting us to remind our classes to make sure that they get that, you get that done. It should have been an email, I think, from Mrs. Thames or Amber Savage and there's like a survey, a survey monkey or something you do online. It goes to our file. They help review us, helps us figure out if we're doing okay. Okay, if you did them, that's great. Yeah, if you had three, sometimes they have you review multiple teachers. I don't think you guys had me, but um, they wanted us just to tell people to do it. All right, well, <clears throat> Okay, this is how mama gets her raise. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I joke around. I, I always encourage my students to be honest because I take that to heart. It's you guys reviewing me. If there's something I can do better. There's something I'm doing wrong. I, you know, I look at all the suggestions and uh, see what I can do to improve. So, all right. Well, if we're done for the day, um, Thank you guys, sorry about this morning. Um, hopefully tomorrow is less chaotic and my computer and puppy um, cooperate. I will see you guys tomorrow and have a good day.